Hello anatomy and physiology students. Welcome to your online respiratory anatomy lab. As you know, the respiratory system is a very important body system. If it stops working even for a few minutes, we end up dead. So its job is to bring oxygen into the body and get rid of carbon dioxide. So we're going to talk about how we do that through looking at the respiratory anatomy. So first off, here's a list of topics. We're going to talk about the divisions of the respiratory system. We're then going to focus on the anatomy of the upper respiratory system, larynx, and lower respiratory system. And finally, we're going to conclude our discussion by looking at the histology of some respiratory structures, such as the trachea and also the alveoli. So now we're going to talk about divisions of the respiratory system. And depending on which textbook you're using, they might have slightly different structures that fall within the upper and lower respiratory tract. For our textbook, the upper respiratory tract are all the structures basically in the head that help to conduct the air from the nose to the nasopharynx, uh, oropharynx, and eventually uh, down towards the trachea. Now, before we get to the trachea, we're going to enter the lower respiratory tract. So the lower respiratory tract starts here at the larynx, and it goes from the larynx to the trachea, trachea to the primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, uh, bronchioles, and eventually to the alveoli. So that's the lower respiratory tract or lower respiratory system. Now, you might also hear of a functional classification for the respiratory system. In this case, we're talking about the conducting zone and the respiratory zone. So the conducting zone here are all the structures that help to get air down to the site where gas exchange takes place. So this includes all the upper respiratory tract structures as well as many of the lower respiratory tract structures as well. So again, going from our nose, nasopharynx, uh, to our larynx, our trachea, our primary and secondary bronchi, so all of those are part of the conducting zone. They conduct air, but they don't undergo any gas exchange. Now, once we get down to the respiratory zone, we're talking about an area where gas exchange actually takes place. So this would be, of course, the alveoli as well as the alveolar ducts and the respiratory bronchioles. All right, so let's talk about some of those upper respiratory zone structures. First off, let's start out with the nose. So the nose has two openings right here, and the two openings are subterminal, so stuff's not falling down on them. Uh, and then once the air travels through the nose, it's going to go through our nasal cavity, and then it's going to go across these three nasal conchi. Now, the nasal conchi can be divided into a superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha. And the job of these conchi or turbinate bones is they have lots of mucosal epithelium on there. And if you were to look down them uh, directly in front of them, they look like a rose. They have this spiral pattern. And the purpose of these nasal conchi is to filter the incoming air uh, and also warm it up and humidify it because it's going to be going down the lungs, which are very, very delicate tissues. Okay, other structures we can see here in our upper respiratory tract are our sinuses. So we have a sphenoid sinus right here within the sphenoid bone and a frontal sinus within the frontal bone. Now the primary purpose of these sinuses is as an area where we have a resonating chamber for our voice. Uh, it gives our voice a certain timbre or timbre or whatever you call it. And you can always hear when somebody's uh, sinuses are sort of plugged up because when they have a cold, they sound a little bit like this and your voice changes a lot because those sinuses can become included with mucus. Okay, and now in back of that, we have our posterior nasal aperture. This is in back of the nasal conchi. And then in back of that, we have something called the nasopharynx. Now, the nasopharynx is the first part of this hollow tube called the pharynx. And the pharynx is a weird tube because it's a tube where potentially we're going to have air going down there, but we might also have some water in there when we're drinking things or even some food when we're swallowing. So it's sort of a tube where anything goes. So the nasopharynx is up here in the uh, nasal cavity. And then below that, we have the oropharynx, which is in back of the oral cavity. And finally, we have the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is basically everything above the larynx itself. So the laryngopharynx is above the larynx, and the larynx is this very magical and important valve, which is going to decide where the stuff is going. If it's air, it's going to divert that down to the trachea, which is down here. Uh, and if it's going to be food, it's going to divert it down the esophagus, which we'll see in just a second. Okay, before we get there, we need to talk about the tonsils. So tonsils uh, are part of our immune system. We talked about them um, a couple chapters ago. And it used to be that tonsils uh, were thought to be useless. And so if somebody got tonsillitis more than a couple times during their childhood, they probably just pulled those things out. But now we know that tonsils do serve an important immune function, so we tend to leave them in if at all possible. Okay, and then we're going to talk about the opening of the eustachian or auditory tube. And remember, the eustachian tube was a tube that went from the middle ear, and it goes to the back of the nasopharynx right here. And the purpose of this is to 
allow for equilibration of air pressure in the middle ear with the surrounding uh, atmospheric pressure. So think about what happens when you're driving up to the top of the poly or something like that. You feel that pressure in your ears because as atmospheric pressure is reduced, the air in your middle ear expands and it has to have somewhere to go. And so what you usually do is kind of jut your jaw or yawn or something like that, and that will open up this aperture right here, allowing that excess gas to escape into your nasopharynx. Okay, now we have a structure called the uvula. The uvula is part of our soft palate here, and it's a word that looks very similar to vulva, but is not the same, so make sure you spell this correctly. So the uvula, again, is this punching bag-like structure in the back of our uh, soft palate, and we think its use is to cover up the nasopharynx during swallowing and things like that. So if you've ever seen the Muppet Show, when a Muppet's really upset or something like that, you can see that uvula in the back of their mouth. Now, the next structures we're going to talk about are lower respiratory zone structures. This is everything from the larynx downwards. So first off, let's start off with the larynx. The larynx right here is a very prominent structure at the superior part of the trachea, and its job, again, is to divert air down the trachea and food and water and things like that down the esophagus. Okay, so these are the two tubes we're talking about. Right up here, uh, the first uh, most front tube, that is the anterior tube, is the trachea. It's this tube right here. Uh, it's very prominent. And in back of that, you can see the esophagus way back here, but the esophagus right there is pent shut. So this, these are two very different tubes for two very different purposes. The esophagus is for food and drink. The trachea is just for air. The trachea is always held open by cartilage rings. The esophagus is usually pinched shut unless we're swallowing something. Now we're going to take a more detailed look at the larynx here in just a second, but I do want to show the glottis and epiglottis. Now the glottis is the opening of the larynx, so air passes into the glottis and then into the trachea, but that glottis is guarded by a cartilaginous flap called the epiglottis. So the epiglottis, I think we can see right about there, the epiglottis is like one of those trash can lids that stays up all the time uh, and then it can close over. So when we're breathing, uh, it's up in the up position, but when we're swallowing, it closes up and diverts that food or water or whatever uh, down the esophagus. Okay, so now we're going to take a more detailed view at the larynx. And remember, the larynx was on the superior part of the trachea. And this is an anterior uh, blown up view of the larynx. What we can see here is we have our hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is at the superior part of the larynx, and the hyoid bone was this sort of uh, vestigial gill arch, and it helps to hold up and support uh, the larynx itself. And then below that, we have a very prominent thyroid cartilage. Remember, thyroid gland, it's in the same spot. We'll see it here in just a second. But the thyroid cartilage is very prominent. It makes up the Adam's apple, which is very prominent, particularly in males. They tend to have a larger larynx and, of course, larger thyroid cartilage. Now, below that, we have something called the cricoid cartilage. The cricoid cartilage is a very sort of minor in the front part, but very major in the back part of the larynx. And then, of course, we have the thyroid gland. Now, the thyroid gland is part of the endocrine system. It is responsible for secreting thyroxin, which controls our metabolic rate. It's also responsible for secreting calcitonin, which controls our calcium levels. Now, let's take a look at a posterior and mid-sagittal view of the larynx. Now, posterior just means from behind, and mid-sagittal here is sort of like a banana split through the larynx. And here's what we can see. So, up top, we have our hyoid bone. On this side here, you can see the actual body of the hyoid, whereas if you take a look at the posterior view, we're actually looking at something called the uh, greater horns of the hyoid. And again, the hyoid bone is that bone that's here to support the larynx. Uh, inferior to that, we have our epiglottis. The epiglottis is this cartilaginous flap that is usually being held open and only shuts over the glottis uh, in times of swallowing food or drink. So normally it's allowing air to pass across uh, the glottis into the trachea itself and down to the lungs. Okay, below that or inferior to that, we have our thyroid cartilage. Again, very prominent in males. It makes up our Adam's apple. And below that, we have our vocal folds. The vocal folds here are our true vocal cords and are responsible for generating sound during speech. So the vocal folds are comprised of connective tissues and as uh, air moves across them, they vibrate and make sound and we can voluntarily control the pitch of that sound by stretching the cords out to make a higher pitch sound or letting them to relax to make a lower pitch sound. Now, because men have larger larynxes than females on average, they tend to have longer vocal cords and also lower voices.
Okay, inferior to the vocal folds, we of course have our cricoid cartilage. You can see the cricoid cartilage seems to be fairly minor uh, in the front part, but if we look in back posterior view, we see the cricoid cartilage makes up a large part of the larynx there. Okay, and below that we have our tracheal cartilages. Again, the purpose of the tracheal cartilages was to hold the trachea open, make sure that it's patent and open so we can have effective and efficient breathing at all times. All right, now that we've finished talking about the larynx, we're gonna talk about the other lower respiratory zone structures, and those include things such as the trachea, the primary and secondary and tertiary bronchi. Now, we can't see all those structures right now because that's right, the heart is in the way. The heart is in the area in between the lungs, an area called the mediastinum. In fact, there's actually a groove in here called the cardiac notch uh, within the left lung uh, because the apex of that heart sort of protrudes into that lung load. So that's some terminology you need to know. So in order to see those other tubes, uh, we're gonna have to get rid of the heart, so let's do that now. All right, so the heart's been removed. We're now gonna zoom in on the remaining structures so we can identify them more easily. All right, so there we are, we've zoomed in, we've removed the heart, and what you can see is that up top we have our trachea. Again, the trachea was that hollow tube below the larynx that is taking uh, air into the lungs. Once we get in the lungs themselves, the junction of the trachea and the bronchi is called the carina. The carina is sort of like a keel-like structure right there. And then we have a branching off of primary bronchi. Bronchi is plural, bronchus is singular. So what you can see here is the primary bronchus here of the left lung. So we go from the trachea to a left and right primary bronchus. And those primary bronchi are gonna branch into secondary bronchi. And those secondary bronchi are gonna branch into tertiary bronchi. So they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, the other structures I wanna talk about here are the lobes of the lungs. What you should notice is the right lobe has three conspicuous lobes and the left lung has only two conspicuous lobes. So these lobes are divided by structures called fissures. So up top here in the right lung, you can see we have a horizontal fissure that goes horizontally and something that should be more oblique here, it's called our oblique fissure that sort of travels down at an angle. Now, the horizontal fissure and oblique fissure divide the right lung into three lobes, and those are called the superior, middle, and inferior lobes of the right lung. If we take a look at the left lung, on the other hand, we only see that we have an oblique fissure. So because we only have one fissure, we only have two visible lobes, and those would be the superior and inferior lobes of the left lung. Okay, last but not least, I wanna talk about another structure that technically may not be part of the respiratory system, but the respiratory system couldn't function without it. And that is definitely the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle, it's a skeletal muscle, part of our muscular system, but it's a primary muscle responsible for ventilating the lungs. Uh, it originates on the ribs and inserts here on our central tendon, uh, and it bows downwards during inspiration and bows upwards during expiration. Okay, skeletal muscle, again, it's voluntary, but it also is somewhat automatically controlled by our pons and our medulla oblongata. Other structures coming through our diaphragm I wanna point out is our esophagus right here. The esophagus is coming through a hiatus or a break in the diaphragm, traveling down towards the stomach. We also have uh, another area where the aorta is peeking through that diaphragm to supply the inferior part of the body with oxygen-rich blood. Okay, before we move on to the histological structures, I'm gonna talk briefly about how the diaphragm works to ventilate the lungs. So what I have here is a simple bell jar model. And the model here consists of a simple bell jar, which is right here. Uh, on the inside there, you can see we have uh, two balloons that are inside there, and they have a tube that goes up there to the outside that's sort of like our trachea. And below that, we have something called uh, a rubber membrane, which is actually uh, analogous to our diaphragm. So what you're gonna see is when I pull down on this rubber membrane that the lungs in there, the actual balloons, will inflate with air, and that's because I've created a vacuum in there increasing the volume of the cavity, which decreases the pressure, and that causes air to rush in. If I push down the other way, okay, this is what would happen when I exhale. The diaphragm bows upward, and that creates more pressure inside the cavity, and that forces air out of the lungs. The big picture here is the lungs themselves have no muscle tissue in there whatsoever. They're sort of these passive bags of epithelial tissue. So once again, when the diaphragm bows downward, okay, that creates negative pressure, uh, greater internal volume, uh, reduced pressure, and that's gonna cause the lungs to inflate. And then when the diaphragm bows upward, that creates more pressure, uh, less volume, and so that causes the lungs to deflate. So simple mechanisms of pulmonary ventilation.
Okay, we're going to finish off this lecture by talking about some respiratory histology. And remember, histology is the study of tissues. The first structure we're looking up here is the trachea. Remember, the trachea's job was to funnel air uh, from the outside uh, through the larynx down the trachea and eventually get into the respiratory zone of the lungs where we have gas exchange taking place. Now, its job is to get air where it needs to go, and so it's a nice rigid and hollow tube. The inside of that tube is called a lumen. In fact, the inside of any hollow organ can be called a lumen. And the reason we have such this nice hollow opening there is we have a rigid tracheal cartilage that is holding the trachea open during most times. And that's very different than the esophagus. The esophagus, which is in back of the trachea, would be up here, uh, is usually closed off except when we're swallowing something. So the tracheal cartilages help to make sure the lumen is patent or open. But what you should notice is the cartilages are not true rings. That is, the tracheal cartilage does not extend all the way across. This area that we're looking at right here is actually made up of smooth muscle, and this is called the trachealis muscle. So the trachealis muscle is smooth muscle, and its job is to contract when we're coughing. When you get something down your trachea, you're going to stimulate nerve endings in here, and that's going to cause a reflexive coughing reflex. Now what's going to happen is your diaphragm is going to bow upwards violently, uh, and you're going to propel air that way. The other thing that's going to happen is that trachealis muscle is going to contract, and that's going to take the opening of the trachea from something like this to something like this. And as that air is forced out that tiny little tube, it's going to generate a tremendous amount of pressure, which is helpful in trying to expel foreign objects that end up down the respiratory tract. All right, let's take a look at the trachea in greater detail. And what you can see here, the trachea is sort of divided into three different layers. Uh, the most interior layer here is called the mucosal layer. The mucosal layer here is made up of mucus producing tissue, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the tissue we're looking at here is epithelial tissue, and specifically it's pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. We're going to see that in the next slide. Now below that we have something called the lamina propria, which is a connected tissue layer that helps to separate us from uh, a deeper layer called the submucosal layer. Submucosal layer is made up of connective tissue, but it also contains lots and lots of these seromucous glands in there. And then inferior to that, or I should say uh, beyond that, exterior to that, we have something called the hyaline cartilage layer. So the hyaline cartilage there, remember, was just that tracheal ring, which is helping to hold that trachea open so it doesn't collapse. Now we're going to take a more detailed look at the mucosal layer of that trachea. Remember, the mucosal layer was made up of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, and that is a mouthful. So what does that mean? Well, pseudostratified here means that it looks like it's multiple layers, but it's really not. All of these cells are, in fact, attached to the basement membrane. The other thing is these cells are columnar. We can tell because the uh, nuclei are nice elongate ellipses, so we know that they are columnar cells. And the last word we need to think about is ciliated. If we look on top of these cells at 400x or 1000x magnification, we can actually see these finger-like projections there called cilia. And the job of the cilia is to propel things. And so basically what it's propelling is mucus or snot, and that's located just above it. So the snot or mucus is produced by cells called goblet cells embedded in the mucosal epithelium. And its job of this mucus is to trap particulate material. And eventually that mucus is going to be uh, propelled by our cilia up to the pharynx where the mucus is either spat out or <clears throat> it's swallowed. Okay, our last histological section we're looking at today is histology of the lung tissue itself. And the lung tissue is made up primarily of simple squamous epithelium, and those simple squamous epithelium are creating structures called alveoli. So alveoli are the main structures within the respiratory membrane. They are where gas exchange takes place. So the alveoli are, again, simple squamous epithelium. They're one cell layer thick. And why is that great? Well, if we're only one cell layer thick, that's really good for exchanging gases. Remember, oxygen is in these alveoli, and it's going to then move into the pulmonary capillaries. Uh, CO2 is in the pulmonary capillaries, and it's going to move into the alveoli so it can be exhaled. So here we're just taking a higher magnification view of the lung tissue itself. And again, that lung tissue is divided into alveoli, and alveoli is where respiration is occurring, specifically external respiration, that is exchange of gases uh, between the air in the lungs and the pulmonary capillaries. Remember, the alveoli themselves are simple squamous epithelium, which makes them really good for diffusion. Uh, they don't have much support in there. There's no skeletal structure in there. And so the only way that these alveoli are held open is by surfactant that's produced by these cells in here that helps to break down the surface tension that would normally collapse those alveoli and keep them from working efficiently.